All right, now it's time for our speakers. First up, we have the New York Times' own Jeremy Ashkenaz. Take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I know it's late on, the, on Thursday night, but uh, it's, been, it's been fun so far. I'm going to talk about some fun um, little Canvas tricks. Um, but before I do, I saw that the theme of the, of the conference we're supposed to talk about is open source uh, tips and tricks and guidelines. And I only have one very small piece of advice for you, which you probably can't even read. But just, uh, which is just, uh, you know, don't don't be this guy. If you're uh, if you're opening tickets on a, on a GitHub project, um, I know it's all very easy to do, and we've all done it. Sort of, you know, very very easily. Just, you know, there's this thing that's annoying. I'm just going to open up this quick ticket. But uh, but you don't want to be this guy trying to add uh, abstract and interface classes like Java and PHP have to uh, to CoffeeScript. Um, so with that out of the way, I figured we would uh, we would talk a little about some fun some fun Canvas stuff. So. So um, recently, um, at the Times, I've been I've been doing a, trying to think about other things we can be open sourcing um, as we're doing work. So I work in interactive news. Um, recently, we did a whole bunch of election stuff, which which I'm going to show a little bit of. Um, but sort of you know these very very focused libraries that is something that you write you know you use it in a couple different places and it would really benefit from having more eyes on it and having it sort of expand its capabilities, getting hammered out, getting all the kinks worked out for different browsers. Um, and uh, one thing, these are some examples, um, actually, so this is using the uh, reveal.js presentation that was, uh, that was discussed earlier, which is great because I can stick in iframes in this sucker. So these are actually just loading off of our admin box downstairs inside the firewall. But, uh, but, but uh, one, one nice thing about, about little canvas charts is that they're very, very simple. Um, you don't have to deal with a lot of the complexity and machinery of, uh, of something richer, more interactive, and you just have your very basic API. You can draw your shapes, draw your pixels. And, uh, and you're off to the races. This is one example of something we did, or we tried to do a bit of on, uh, on election night, although I can't scroll it. And, uh, and here's another example, hopefully this one I will be able to scroll, at least vertically, of, uh, of some campaign finance stuff that we were doing with various super PACs and tracking how much they had raised and spent over the course of the campaign and where the donations came from and who the donors were. And uh, here is a larger, and maybe I can do that. Doesn't work too well. There's actually the Republicans over there on the right, which disappear when I, when I shrink it. Um, have an interactive graphic of sort of merging together Obama as well as the DNC, as well as the largest um, Democratic super PAC associated with Obama, and look at how much money they're raising and spending in each month. And so this is just a little canvas chart that you can look at the cumulative view as well and sort of see how these things are put together. And so all of these are put together in a similar way, and I'm going to talk about a few of these libraries. So the first one, if I can advance the slide. We're going to get some help from uh, Hakeem here on the, <laughs> there we go, look at that. Um, is, just, is just your basics. So, so what, what are the problems with Canvas, right? If you're using something fancier like D3, which you probably should be doing if you're smart. Um, but in this case, we want it to work in IE7 and IE8, and I mean, maybe even IE6 correctly. So, uh, so we're going to just stick to the basics. So the hardest thing about, about doing you know, your basic charts, of course, is not actually drawing the chart. Drawing the chart is not that bad, but doing the axes is always a pain, right? You've got to format the numbers right, you've got to get the ticks in the right place and everything. So just a super simple, this is not open sourced yet, but hopefully it will be soon, a super simple library just to draw axes, and that's all it does, right? You give it, you give it your numbers, I want an axis from 0 to 100, it gives you back an axis from 0 to 100. You can tell it how big you want it to be. You can do it, you know, do it from 0 to 10,000, it'll format it for you correctly. Um, you can do odd ranges, and it'll find the nice sort of even numbers that fit on that range without necessarily touching the ends if they're not nice and even. Um, it'll do it for, although this is getting formatted a little bit funny, hopefully we won't have to scroll later. Um, you can do it for dates, pass in date objects, and get back out your nice New York Times style um, months. Um, this one you can't see. Let's see if I can fix this so we don't have this problem. If you bear with me for a brief moment. Do you guys know how big this screen's supposed to go? Is this the maximum size? Eight hundred by six hundred is too small. Let's go up to this at least. All right. That is much better. So you can do your little vertical axis, tell it how many ticks you want to go on. So you, you basically get the idea. 
Um, and the nice thing about this is that these axes are just generating um, little bits of HTML. So it's just some divs and, uh, and div labels and divs for the ticks. So you can style them with CSS wherever you want to. So in this case, we're doing an axis. This is sort of our fancy example. An axis that ranges from 0 to 360. You put a class name on it so we can use CSS to change the font and add some red and some double borders. You tell it to flip vertically. You're saying every four, so the tick size is 45. So every 45 units in the domain draw a tick. And then also add a formatting function, which is going to make it do, do degrees, um, so 360 degrees here. So this is sort of an example of how you can use this to do very customized axes. So that's my first, we're doing this lightning <coughs> talk in 20 minutes. So that's the first of the three libraries that helps make uh, Canvas more, more easy to reuse for these kinds of purposes. The second one is a hard piece, which is not ours. This is something that Tim Cameron Ryan um, built, I think, many years ago, maybe like four or five years ago. And I don't know why it's never caught on. It doesn't make much sense to me, except that it was never really sort of popularized. Um, but canvas.swf.js, which you can find on GitHub, is a, um, and actually let me click on this and see if this example works, if the Wi-Fi is working. There you go. Um, this, is, this is just a, a quick little sort of um, animated example. But the point about this animation is that it basically works this well in IE when you load this Canvas thing which is really nice, um, because if you ever tried to use Raphael for doing animations or other things that fall back to VML, um, the performance is really not there. And Flash has sort of, you know, it's possible in Flash to get the kind of performance you need to do animations and more sophisticated graphics. And the way that this works is that um, a lot of folks tried, I think back at the very beginning of the Canvas element to do Flash fallbacks, and it never really worked out, because if you do it naively, what you're going to do is you're going to send every single Canvas command that you're drawing. You're going to say, fill rect here, stroke line here. Every single command you're going to try to send over to Flash over the external interface API. And that's way too slow. Not because Flash is slow necessarily, but because the external interface sending that message round trip is too slow. Um, and then people just kind of gave up at that point. They're like, oh, it's too slow. It's not going to work. But you just got to be a little bit smarter. So what this library does um, is first it starts out by saying, all right, we know what our API is, we're going to shrink it down. So basically they make opcodes for every command in the Canvas API. So, um, so in this case, all, like two data URL is going to be one, save is going to be two, restore is going to be three. And then the next thing that they do is say, we're going to buffer up all of the commands that you draw. So in this case, this is the execute commands function that's saying, if we have any commands in our buffer, um, what we're going to do is send all of those commands together over the external interface API all at once. So you're buffering and you're flushing. And then the last thing you do is you only do it every 30 milliseconds. So basically, you have a timer and every 30 milliseconds, anything that you've done in the last 30 milliseconds in the JavaScript side, you buffer it all up and you send it all over to Flash in one message, and then Flash can draw it all at once. And that's how this thing becomes actually performant enough to, to use in real world cases. So that is canvas.swf. And then the third piece of the puzzle is uh, Canvas Hover. So now you've got, you've got your shapes, you're drawing them, you're drawing them in IE and it's working sort of transparently. It's implementing the Canvas API in terms of Flash, so that's working. You've got your axes and they look nice, but what you're still missing is your mouse interactions, right? So now instead of, instead of SVG where you've got all these nice DOM elements and you actually have sort of pads, you can have mouse over, mouse out events on, you've got one big Canvas object and you have no idea what the user is clicking on or where the user is in that shape. Um, and there's a really fun old school graphics trick that can be used to get around this problem. So this is, this is a library that, that I hope to open source soon as well, that basically, um, it, this is the API that it gives you. So you know, you know in Canvas you have this context object, the two dimensional context that you're using, and then it's got all these functions on it for, for drawing various shapes. And this adds a new function called value. So, so basically you call Canvas however you, you pass in your Canvas and it, adds, it augments the context um, object with this function. And value lets you associate arbitrary values with whatever you happen to be drawing in the canvas at the time. So I say value, I pass in you know, what political party it is, what month we're talking about in that chart, and how much money was raised or spent in that month. And then I continue to draw my shapes. I draw my rectangles, I fill them with, with diagonal lines, I do whatever. And then, and then everything I draw from that point until the next time I call value is associated with that value. And then this is the other side of the API. So I, I'm wrapping my canvas element um, with this canvas hover library. And I now have a mouse over function. I now have a mouse out function. And what happens is um, every time I mouse over a different, a different logical value inside the canvas, I will get my function called passed in whatever value I associated with it at the time. So this is basically what you need to do your interactions. When I go over this particular blue circle over here, then that's associated with this value. I can do my tooltips. I can do my click interactions. I can do whatever I need to do at this point. Um, so here is another iframe, and fortunately this one's going to show up on the screen correctly. So this is actually a live demo of how it's implemented. So, so normally, this, 
bit right here, the ugly red black thing below, is hidden off screen um, and you can't see it. And there's actually a little bit of synergy here because so, so basically, let me explain how the technique works. The way the technique works is for everything that you draw in the canvas, you also draw it to an off screen hidden canvas. And on the off screen hidden canvas, you do everything exactly the same, you have the exact same API except that each logical shape is associated with a unique color. And then the whole point of how you know, you know what shape am I in, I don't have to do the math, I don't have to figure out what polygon am I in, I don't have to do the hit detection. Um, all I have to do is say, give me the color of this pixel, what is the color of this pixel? Knowing that, I know exactly what the particular shape was. So in this case, you can see sort of it's just like slightly, slightly different shades of red going through. Um, and as I mouse over, you know, here, <coughs> that's looking up the color of the pixel right there and giving me back the value that's associated. And, and then actually, and then also redrawing this top one, right? So to get those sort of little dark colors, you're actually redrawing that, that top canvas as well. And that's, and that's the API. And so it's a really ugly hack, um, but it's also nice in that you can sort of black box it and, and abstract it away and get mouse over behavior without really having to worry about it. So, so this doesn't really matter so much in the case of rectangles, right? Doing the hit detection for these rectangles wouldn't be that hard. I can just, you know, is, is the point inside the rectangle? It's an easy test to make, just to iterate through all the rectangles. Here, though, it's a little bit better. So with these, with these paths that are not rectangles and are not necessarily a regular shape, like here's a little sliver of a path over here for the, uh, for the super pack spending, right? So that's something that would be harder to do without, without this kind of hack um, to make it work. You may ask, what are the blue lines in this, you know, I don't see the blue lines, what are they doing? So this is actually something that would be nice if the Canvas API was enhanced to fix it someday, but right now there's no way to turn off anti-aliasing inside of a Canvas. So what that means is that um, whenever you draw your two unique colors right next to each other, they're gonna blend a little bit, right? And right along that seam, you're gonna get a color that's not quite one and not quite the other, and you have no lookup value for that in your hash. And in fact, because you're usually doing sequential values of red, you're gonna get some other value of red. You're blending between two, and you're gonna get something not associated which of course is very bad for the user because they get some tooltip that's completely random and they go right close to the edge of the shape. So what you do is you reserve one of the channels, you say, all right, we're gonna use red and green for all the unique combinations of 255 times 255 that we can make with those unique colors. And then blue, if there's any amount of blue whatsoever in the pixel, I'm gonna pretend like I haven't moved on to the next shape. I'm still on the shape I was on previously. And that's how you sort of get around. That's the, the extra little bit of hack for anti-aliasing. It lets it work without having weird results in between the in between the shapes. And I think that is what I've got for you. So if there's any questions, oops, that wasn't the next slide. <laughs> if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, thanks a lot, folks.